Good morning, everyone. Welcome. Morning. Hi, how's everyone doing? All good, thank you. Excellent. Right, we'll just give it another minute or so just to let everyone kind of filter in. Um, I can still see people being admitted. Hopefully everyone can see um, my screen share. I should just got a well-being um, kind of welcome slide up at the moment. So give me a thumbs up if you can see that, guys, just making sure everything's working. Thanks, Olivia. Thanks, Scott. I want to try and find a change my view so I can see more of you at the moment. It's difficult when I'm screen sharing. So hopefully I'll get to see more of you once I've finished. So how are we doing for time? A few minutes past. Right, I think it's it's three minutes past 10 now. So um, I think we'll get started. There might be a few more people filtering in over the next few minutes, um, but um, they'll be able to hopefully catch up and they're not going to miss too much, really. Um, welcome to the Wellbeing at Work webinar, um, the first of, of 2022. Um, I know it's um, pretty much a month ago now, but I hope everyone had a good Christmas and a happy new year. Um, and I hope everyone's feeling well and um, kind of uh, looking forward to the end of January, which for some reason always seems to feel like the longest um month of the year i saw some crazy you know kind of meme the other day you know something like you know 30 days have you know all this and then the end of thing apart from january which has like 7421 days and i know sometimes it kind of feels like that doesn't it but um we are nearly at the end of january but but thanks to all you all for joining today um thanks for giving us an hour and a half of your time um to talk a little bit about um well-being and specifically today we're going to be looking at sort of building financial well-being um, and we're lucky enough to have Paul Fox with us um, from the Money and Pension Service, um, who I'll pass over to in a few minutes. Um, and he's going to kind of introduce us to the sort of thing that he works on and hopefully generate some questions and, and some sort of discussion that we can then kind of follow through for the rest of the rest of the morning. Um, just a few bits regarding kind of housekeeping. Um, I know most of you here today have been on our webinars before, so you're probably fully aware of kind of how the morning runs. Um, but if it's OK, um, mic wise, keep the mics on mute unless you're kind of obviously, you know, asking a question or, or sharing some sort of thoughts and, uh, and, and sort of experiences. Um, it just kind of helps, you know, less feedback, et cetera. You know, now we're all doing these things sort of virtually um, camera wise please if you if you're happy to keep your cameras on it's lovely seeing everyone's faces just to let you know that obviously we are you know we are recording today's webinar and then we do tend to share that you know sort of further afield and, and for those that can't make the event itself um, so if you prefer not to be seen on that recording then obviously keep your camera off um, but it's completely up to you um, a big thanks to the Chamber, Devon and Plymouth Chamber of Commerce, who obviously are helping us run today's event. Um, and Olivia is sort of working away in the background from the Chamber, making sure everything runs smoothly. So a big thanks to those guys. Um, but yeah, I think we'll, we'll jump on and have a quick look at the agenda. Um, if I can uh, make it work. So timing wise um like i say i'll pass the call to paul fox in a bit um we will have a little break i think um somewhere around about 10 50 if we feel we need that just a chance to, to go and grab a hot drink and, and stretch the legs um and then if we need that opportunity after the break um to a little bit more networking and and sharing ideas then we've got till half 11 if we kind of need it um hopefully we'll stick to time Sometimes I'm a bit guilty of, of, of kind of talking too much um, and going over. But obviously, if you need to disappear at any point, then, then please do so. Um, with regards to sort of the slides and any information that comes up, you know, through the morning, 
all of those will be emailed to you, emailed to you after the event. So please don't feel you're going to miss anything if you do need to drop off and then come back in. Um, and if you've got colleagues that, you know, for whatever reason can't make today, again, we can pass those, those on to them and they can pick it up at a later date. Um, I don't think there's anything else with regards to sort of like how, housekeeping and things question wise i should have said this um chat function so if you've got questions or things you'd like to share and you prefer to pop them in the chat then that's another way that you can do those things um but but yeah jenny's here as well and she'll be keeping an eye on that um but but you know really these are about giving you guys an opportunity um to hear about something new and something for me anyway thinking about financial well-being sort of like very sort of um uh, you know sort of you know current with regards to the current you know issue we've got with you know increasing costs and, and energy prices and i do think that even though maybe we do feel as though from a covid point of view we're now maybe beginning to come out the other side although rates are still you know certainly very high in our area um from a government point of view they are beginning to sort of um reduce those sort of measures that are in place around covid but i think financially this is going to be the year 2022 is going to be the year where we start to see you know severe financial hardship potentially based around the pandemic and, and obviously other things as well and i'm sure paul you know will be able to provide us all with some insight and some some potential things that are available to help people um which we can kind of share with colleagues and, and share within our organizations um before i pass across to paul just a quick update from me Hopefully, most of you know me. I should have said at the start. My name is Greg, Greg Price, Health Improvement Manager at LiveWell Southwest. Um, but just a few bits from our team, just to keep you all, all kind of up to date and, and aware of what we're doing. Um, and then I'll pass across to Paul. Main three things I wanted to just update you on today wellbeing training, wellbeing champions, and then the wellbeing at work awards, and a few things we've got coming up. Um, and it might be we can revisit these at the end of the morning if we want to talk a little bit more, if Jenny's got anything she wants to share um, as well. Um, wellbeing training plan and program for 2022 is now pretty much ready. Um, I've popped a link there on that slide. So when you get the slides later, you'll be able to click on that link and that will take you through to kind of like the, our events calendar um, on our website. Um, and certainly by the end of this month, we would have added all of the training um, offers um, for 2022 to that calendar. So you can see when they are, where they are. Um, the pyramid you can see on the slide is to give us all a kind of better understanding, not just of what training we've got available for organizations and for individuals, but also to give you an understanding of how advanced and who they're applicable to. So the simplest way of looking at it is anything within the introductory kind of area, it's applicable for everyone really within your organization. The things at the top might only be for particular individuals that have a key role in looking after colleagues and looking after individuals within your workplace. Um, sometimes some of the more advanced training come at a cost. So again, that's where it's about picking the right people um, uh, for the right courses. Wellbeing Champions, we'll talk about it in a little while. Um, and some of you will be aware of what Wellbeing Champions are. But this is something that would be applicable to any individual within your organization. Um, and it would just give them that basic knowledge of health and well-being and how to support their colleagues. Um, and then you've got things in the middle as well, which kind of build on that. Um, and if I pop on to the next slide, you can see that our well-being champion training program now includes some of those those other offers, so like the emotional resilience, the Connect Five. Um, and we've now started, I think there may be some individuals within the call today that have that have been part of some of our new kind of training cohorts this year. Um, with 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 I think started about three or four different well-being champion training cohorts with the likes of University Hospitals Plymouth. Um, and I know we started one last week with Go Southwest. Um, and if you've got individuals within your organization that are already wellbeing champions but you're looking to get more or you haven't got any wellbeing champions again get in contact with the team and we can give you a bit more information about what that wellbeing champion program looks like and how it supports the wellbeing at work awards um, and the training that it includes um, we've tried to sort of i suppose take it up another level over the last six months and provide our wellbeing champions with even more information and even more training um, which will hopefully help them to be as effective as they can be you know, back in their place of work and um, supporting others. Um, so lots of stuff going on around training offers 
and wellbeing champion offers. Um, so if you need any more information on any of that, please do get in touch. Um, and then finally, from me, with regards to wellbeing at work, we have got our wellbeing at work annual awards coming up. So our next kind of virtual um, meeting and offer on the 6th of April this year is that kind of annual wellbeing at work awards where we like to celebrate all of the great work that you guys are doing out across the city um, recognize those organizations that have achieved certain criteria on our wellbeing at work awards process so whether that be bronze um, silver or gold continuous improvement while also those organizations that have historically got those and then they're having their reviews to make sure they're still you know at those levels um, so we've got a couple of organizations working towards some of those sort of benchmarks um, which will hopefully they'll cross the line before before we meet in April um, and um, you know it's just an opportunity for us all again to come together share what we're doing and celebrate some of the great work that's been going on across um, across all organizations across Plymouth um, we also like to celebrate some of our well-being champions at that event and we are looking um, to get nominations from organizations for some of their well-being champions that they feel have just done an amazing job over the last 12 months and gone above and beyond you know to look after their to their colleagues and their and their work friends so again a bit of a call to action for you guys get booked onto that event get your nominations in if you've got wellbeing champions within your organizations um, again you can click on that link once you get the uh, presentation sent out to you later it will take you to the place where you need to go to book on um, and it would be great to see as many of you as, there as, as possible really um, jenny before i pass across to paul in a bit um, are there any kind of questions or bits that have come through from the from the chat um, no, not at the moment, Greg. That's it's, fine. It's Thank fine. you. That's fine. Thank you. Um, so yeah, um, like I said before, there'll be an evaluation form and the slides that will go out to you um, either later on this afternoon or tomorrow. Um, and from my point of view, just keep up the great work. Stay in touch. Um, you can contact me direct via the top email address there, or you can contact us as a team on the kind of the generic email address underneath. Um, but what I will do <clears throat> is I'll quickly stop sharing. And then I will introduce you um, to Paul. Uh, where's it gone? So yeah, Paul um, is from the Money and Pension Service. Um, Paul Fox and has kindly agreed to join us today to take us through some information around kind of financial well-being and what we can do to help our our colleagues and individuals that we know, both at work and at home, I guess. Um, so Paul, welcome. Thanks for joining us. Um, I will now put myself on mute and, and pass over to you. Fabulous. Thank you, Greg. And um, good morning. Good morning, everybody. I love this uh, Zoom where you sort of get the full grid view of everybody who's participating in an event. Uh, take this in the right way, but it always reminds me of the opening. This is me showing my age of the old Muppet show where all the characters used to come on behind those windows. The only thing is I'm never quite sure who to focus on. Eye contact is quite difficult when there's there's 30 people in front of you, but we'll we'll do what we can. So look, I'm, I'm really delighted to uh, be able to attend this morning and support uh, Live Well Southwest and the wider community here in across Devon and across Plymouth and across South Hams with, with financial wellbeing. And I'm only going to put up literally a, a couple of minutes of an intro slide just so we can give you a bit of background about the money and pension service and what we do and um apart from that i really don't do powerpoints very much i find them very um i find them fuzzy formal i'd much rather uh, engage and, and have some more of a conversation with you about money and, and different things that we can look at so i'm going to quickly share my screen here uh, so there we go share we're in great um okay so my name's paul fox and and i head the government's money and pension service for the southwest of england and i'm dialing in this morning from a very wet and miserable west dorset just near dorchester this morning so i'm not too far from everybody um the money and pension service is what's known as an arm's length body of government so we report to the department for work and pensions uh, there are uh, our overseers and we also advise the treasury on things such as consumer protection uh, financial capability 
and, and debt advice and over indebtedness amongst the population. So we have quite a broad role. And really our overarching remit is to help people right across the country have a better relationship with money at, at every stage of their lives. And we all have times in our life where we think about money in, in different ways. And part of our role here at the Money and Pension Service is to look at really from cradle almost to grave here, the, the way people have conversations about money, the way people have an understanding and make decisions about money. So we put together what's called the UK Strategy for Financial Wellbeing. This was launched with fantastic timing two weeks before the first lockdown in 2020. So about a quarter of it had to be immediately ripped up and, uh, and redrafted, which was just, just peachy. But these things are sent to triers. And in front of you there, these are the five sort of main areas that, that we work across. We, we work across what we call financial foundations, so financial education. Unfortunately, in this country, financial education isn't uh, done very well. There is an element of it in schools, in the national curriculum, I think when the kids are about 12 or 13. But uh, with the academization, for example, of a lot of schools, they don't have to follow the national curriculum. So a lot of academies have taken financial education out of their, of, of their, of their set of, of topics. And a lot of kids simply aren't growing up um, with a very good understanding about, about money and about how to make financial decisions. And it's really key that over the next decade that we try and work very hard to, to improve that. So we're doing a lot of projects across uh, England and the UK and in the Southwest as well around financial education. That's one of our core topics. We're also looking at what we call nation of savers. And I suppose by that, I don't just mean saving. Really, really, I'm talking about financial resilience. Something that this pandemic over the last two years has highlighted regretfully is the woeful lack of financial resilience across many, many households in the Southwest. And we know, for example, that across England, there are around and about 7 million households who do not have adequate financial resilience to deal with a relatively small unexpected cost of around and about 100 pounds. And that's just been exacerbated in the last two years. So a lot of the work that we're doing at the moment is around trying to look over the longer term, how we can help particularly households that are on lower incomes or perhaps whose incomes fluctuate because they have uh, various roles, perhaps they're self-employed or in the gig economy. How can we actually help them develop a sort of a savings habit so that when, as, as they do go through life, they've got somewhat of a financial buffer to, to help them. So a lot of our work's around that. We also work a lot around the credit area. We are very concerned about the number of people who are using high cost, short term credit products to simply get by month to month. And a lot of these products aren't healthy anyway. But if they're having to be utilized for people to get through week to week, month to month, there are other ways that people, if they need to access finance, can access finance. And I'll come on to that a little bit later on, um, you know, the likes of payday loans and so forth. Um, we also work very heavily in the debt arena, and this is probably one of the most difficult areas of our work, really. We fund the great majority of debt advice across across England, it's a little bit different in the devolved nations. And across the Southwest at the moment, there is a tsunami of debt uh, on the way. I don't think there's any other way to, to dress that down. We know that the demand for debt advice is going to peak probably towards the end of this year. And, and the reasons for that, uh, I'll come on to in, in a little bit and, and what help there is available for people or people that you know, who may be struggling with indebtedness. There is help out there. We can help with that. We also look at what we call future focus. So pensions, the probably the most boring financial topic in the known universe is pensions. Um, 
everybody who gets their annual statement from a pension provider that runs to about 30 pages of absolute drivel will no doubt agree with me to some extent on that. But one of the things that we very much want to do is to encourage and work with people to engage with their pensions actually earlier in life. Because, you know, a lot of us uh, amass little pension pots. You know, it's, it's rare now for somebody to stay in a job for 40 years. So uh, starting to think as early as you can about what opportunities you might need to look out for to try and facilitate an older part of your life where you are financially healthier. And so we do a lot of work around that, but I'll, I'll come on to that. Right, Greg, I'm going to stop sharing this screen now because that's enough PowerPoint for, for one morning. That's, that's good. So I'm actually going to look at what we're going to do. I'm going to look at a few topics that uh, I, I sort of sent an agenda, if you like, over to Greg before Christmas. But I'm going to look at two broad topics and I'm going to dive into for about the next 20 minutes or so. And we're going to look at some things around budgeting and saving, around some uh, behavioural aspects of budgeting and saving and about money health. Um, I'm also going to touch a little bit on scams and uh, scams, unfortunately, are absolutely everywhere at the moment. Every single day of your life, there are thousands of people in this country and abroad. They're waking up, getting out of bed and their sole objective for the day is to fleece your wallets or purses of hard earned cash. And I don't want that to happen. So I'm going to talk to you a little bit about scams. Some of the things you can look out for uh, really quite interesting stuff. And then I'm going to look at borrowing and and debt and uh, we're not going to go too deeply into uh, debt but what I want to just talk to you a little bit about is if if people are concerned or you know that there are people in your your family circle or your friendship circle perhaps your colleagues if you know people who are struggling what help is there and how you access that and something I think before I kick off here really important is that we are as a government body we are completely independent and we are completely impartial. We do not represent any commercial interests, any financial services companies, any particular products. So what I'm talking about this morning is money guidance. Uh, money advice is something that you would go and pay a financial advisor for. So, for example, you know, if it comes to saving, I will not say to you, look, I think bank account A is better than B. That's absolutely not our remit. But what I will talk about is what the benefits of saving are and, and so forth. So we're going to kick off and have a little bit of a look about um, budgeting. And I think that budgeting is absolutely the most important element that every household can improve in order to develop their financial well-being and actually improve their relationship with money over, over the longer term. And it might seem really obvious. We all think, well, you know, I can do a budget in my head. It takes two minutes. Sometimes it does. But actually, it's a really interesting way of looking at not only ways that you can um, slim down costs that perhaps you don't need, but also to actually think about how do you look over the next three, six and 12 months? What are your objectives financially within your family? Is it the fact that you might be wanting to go on a holiday for a week? Is it that your ambition is to get uh, a new car or perhaps one of your children is going to be heading off to, to university or off to college and you need to have some finance in place? So looking at different ways of setting up a budget is is a really powerful tool and it, it doesn't have to be complicated. And what I don't want you to think is that, oh, you know, I'm in my 30s, my 40s, my 50s. I, I know about budgeting. We all broadly know what a budget is. but I still do a budget. I turned 50 last year and I still do a budget a couple of times a year. I just look ahead with my wife as to what we're doing over the next six months, you know, what we're likely to need and where we need to put things around. If you set a budget, you're less likely to end up in debt. You're more likely to have a good credit rating, which is obviously important as you go through life. You're able to spot areas where you can make savings. And this links in with that financial resilience uh, element that we were talking about earlier if you can start to make some savings by achieving a, a budget and looking at a budget as a, as a household or a family 
then there are opportunities there quite often to start thinking, well, do you know what? There's a small amount there each month. We've been able to put that aside. Let's develop that and do something with it. And, and you're less likely, if you budget, you're less likely to be caught out by, by unexpected costs. And, you know, what do you need? You, you, you don't need a lot to get started on your budget. You know, I'm talking household bills, financial products, your insurances, bank charges, that sort of stuff. You know, um, obviously things like commuting have changed in the last two years. I, I work from home. But before before I joined the Money and Pension Service, I was commuting to Hampshire every day. And, you know, these things rack up. So, you know, your holidays, do you go to the gym? What do you need on your leisure? All those sorts of things. But we make it very easy. We have a money we have a, a consumer facing brand. It's called Money Helper. There's a website moneyhelper.org.uk and all this information will go out to Greg afterwards but we have a budget planning tool on there an interactive budget planning tool and it's a really really good bit of kit it breaks down all your finances by category it'll personalize some tips and guidance for you when you finish and it's a good place you can record all your spending have a look at it have a cup of tea set a budget and just set yourself a challenge maybe um, you know, just for one month, set a budget. Uh, and if you stick to that budget, see what difference it's made. It, I find it really, really helpful. And I can't tell you enough what a powerful tool this, this interactive budget planner is. So that's the first thing that I, I wanted to touch on this morning. And on a kind of a related is a money health check. And a money health check sounds a bit of a strange thing, really. But what I want to think about here is that every now and again, it's a really positive thing to do to improve and to help your financial well-being, to take stock of where you are. Um, companies do it every year by way of a balance sheet. It's a, it's a snapshot of a particular day in a company's life. And even if you do it once a year, which I, I recommend doing, you know, it's, it's an hour's worth of work perhaps for you and your spouse or your partner, but it's a really powerful way of just keeping on top of, uh, keeping the horizon open of, of where you are broadly. And it will depend on where you are in your lives. You know, we all have different financial priorities at different points in our life. When I was in my 20s, in the early 1990s, my priorities were getting paid on a Friday and blowing as much of it as I could in Leicester City Centre on, on the weekend and then handing a wee bit over to my mum when I got home, if she was lucky. That, that was pretty much it. But as you move into your late 20s, your 30s, you start to get into a career. You may, with your other half, be looking at purchasing a house or purchasing one on your own. You're getting on the rental ladder, all sorts of things. Children come along, families start. And there is that horrendous statistic around children that uh, typically a child will cost you around at about £300,000 from birth to the age of 18, which I find an eye-watering amount of money. As a parent, which I am, um, I never would have looked at it in that way all those years ago. But, you know, you, your money priorities change. This is what I'm trying to get at for you. And so to undertake a sort of a money health check once a year, just to see where you are, what are your savings looking like? What are your longer term ambitions? Is it to upscale a house? Uh, perhaps you want to relocate and move to a different area. It may also be that um, a sort of a financial shock has come along, an economic shock. It might be, you know, none of us expected a pandemic around the corner, but there are other things that come along in life that can cause an economic shock. So to have a, a longer term view of where you want to be is a really positive thing. So we have a lot of information and resource around a money health check. It doesn't take very long, probably takes about 20 minutes. And again, it's something that you can do as a family, you can do as an individual, encourage your friends to do it. And I actually find that a money health check once a year actually helps you to think a lot straighter about your money and to try and get an overall picture of where you're at and where you want to be with it. So again, something else to have a look at is, is a money health check. I'm going to nip onto scams because I'm probably going to go through to about quarter to the hour, Greg, and then we'll have some five, six minutes from Q&A. 
scams crikey where do we start with scams um, i'm sure absolutely everybody on this call this morning has had a whatsapp or a text or a phone call uh, email doesn't matter where it's come from somebody somewhere is trying to mug you off and i just don't want that to happen the one i'm getting the most at the moment is probably twice to three times a week i get somebody purporting to be from car phone warehouse and do I want to talk about upgrading my my phone contract? Uh, it's a scam. They're just trying to get some bank details out of me. First thing to remember about scams is it doesn't matter where the messaging comes from. Email, text, doesn't matter. Your bank, your building society, your, your credit card company, they will never, ever ask you for personal or security information uh, in that fashion. They will not use those channels. So if you get a text through and it looks like it's coming from Barclays, for example, because that's a current popular one doing the round, and you have a Barclays account, typically it's going to say something like, oh, um, there's potentially been a security breach on your account. Can you just log into your account and confirm your details? Do not do that. It is a scam. Barclays and the other banks will never approach you that way. I've just become a director of a new organization called the Southwest Fraud Forum, and we are going to be working hard over the coming years to try and help businesses in particular uh, avoid fraud and avoid scams in the region. And, and it is rampant. The, the number of people that have been defrauded, especially during the pandemic, has been horrendous. It can be really, really traumatic for people and their families and, and their friends. So what I would suggest is we have got a lot of content, some really interesting information about the different types of scams that you might face. And I don't want to scare you. I don't want to worry you that every other email is a scam. It's not. It's just that we have um, a responsibility as well. As much as the financial services providers, it really is important that we educate ourselves as well as much as possible about about scamming one of the most popular ones that's been around in the last 18 months to two years is around deliveries we're all getting online deliveries more than ever before for obvious reasons we've not been allowed in shops for a lot of the time and people are getting texts for example saying oh um your delivery you were one pound 40 short on your yodel uh, delivery fee or, or or whatever it was uh, you know please log in and put your credit card detail in um my own parents got scammed uh, back in the autumn. They fell for a, um, a COVID vaccination. They were going on a week's holiday and they ended up uh, being scammed out of about 230 pounds for on holiday COVID tests. We managed to get the money back by the credit card. But if you looked at the email that they received, it looked so authentic. So do have a cup of coffee Saturday morning. If you've got nothing better to do, sit down, have a cup coffee and have a look at our info around scams some really good stuff and um, it might actually surprise you about what scams can look like but you know the way i always think about it is we're not going to let these i uh, can't swear on this this morning but we're not going to let these individuals um take anything that you've worked too bloody hard for and and that's not acceptable to me it's not acceptable to money and pension service so let's do what we can have a look at that I'm going to move a little bit around and talk a little bit about borrowing and a bit about debt. And actually borrowing money is absolutely fine. Actually, debt is OK. And that might sound strange coming from what I'm going to talk about. But the economy actually needs debt and borrowing to revolve without debt and borrowing we'd be going back the better part of a thousand years to the monetary system we, we had then. But it becomes a problem debt when it becomes rolling over and you can't meet that. And so let's have a think about borrowing money to start with. Everybody borrows money at some point throughout their life, and that's absolutely fine. But always ask yourself, you know, do you need to borrow that to start with? Is there another way that you can fund or finance something without borrowing? If you need to borrow, that's OK. But just as long as you've had a bit of time to make that decision. But using the right type of credit in the best way can actually help you over the longer term. So it, it might be for something that's unexpected. 
you know, the fridge freezer might blow up and you need to spend 300 quid on a new one. Um, my wife's car had to go into the garage only about 10 days ago and walked out with a 600 pound bill because we hadn't bothered doing some maintenance on it in the last year. And, you know, these things were unexpected. Um, so we need to be able to deal with them and you might need to do them by borrowing. So, you know, feel more in control of your finances. So when, when you're looking to borrow, ask yourself, do you need to spend the money? Are there any other ways of finding that money I need? And very importantly, can you afford to pay back the money you're planning to borrow? So that, that's absolutely key. One thing I, I pretty much want to steer people away from is, is the use of these high cost um, short term credit products. They're not healthy. They're legal or a lot of them are legal. Uh, but the fees and the interest are eye-wateringly astronomical. And it's going to be difficult to extricate yourself uh, by using some of these products. Uh, I'm doing a lot of work at the moment with several credit unions throughout the Southwest. Uh, most of you on this call will be eligible to uh, approach your local credit union if you need to borrow money. And I would absolutely urge you to do so. Really excellent ethical organizations. They can loan money at very, very reasonable interest rates, certainly compared to some of these high profile products that you see uh, all these, um, you know, influencers marketing on online. Um, so have a look at the different options that we've got at Money Helper about do you need to borrow money? And if you do, absolutely fine. As I've said, there's nothing wrong with that inherently. But just make sure that you're taking a bit of time to get the right borrowing for you that fits your, your lifestyle, it fits your income and your affordability. Um, please don't rush to borrow. Always take a bit of time to just think, right, how is this going to work for me? We've got lots of information on, on the Money Helper website, or you can speak to us. Um, you know, we have a, a bank of professionals. You can speak to them on a one to one basis. They will be able to help you if you've got concerns, you, you want to borrow money. So have a look at that. Uh, and now we move on, I think, a little bit just to, to, to debt. And I'm, I'm, I'm going to deal with debt and one other topic before we kind of spin the floor open a little bit. Debt is very much still a taboo topic in this country. We simply don't talk about debt. And at the moment, across England, there are around and about nine million households who are over indebted. So they are actually rolling their debt over each month. And if you can actually manage that debt, then OK, you know, that's a positive thing. But when you reach the point where the debt is starting to manage you, you actually need to think about getting some professional help. And one thing I would counsel you is that if you drop onto Google, for example, which we do for everything now in life, of course, and let's say you put in um, debt help Devon just as a search. Out of the first 50 or so links that come up, a great many of them will be commercial organizations who are, are basically trying to get a commission or a fee out of you to refer you in to some form of debt solution plan, uh, which they will cash in. And in some of these debt solution plans, the commissions for these companies selling your details on can run into thousands of pounds. And it might not be the right solution for you or for your family. Give us a call. Contact us at the Money and Pension Service. We provide funding to Citizens Advice for debt advice across England um, and also several other organisations. There are some great organisations doing work here. Step Change, the debt charity. There's some great work by uh, Christians Against Poverty across the southwest uh, as well. But come and speak to us first at the Money and Pension Service. Only about one in three people who are seriously over indebted actually go and seek some professional help, which is worryingly low. And a lot of the reason is what I just alluded to. It's a taboo subject. We feel ashamed and we shouldn't. We've all been in debt at some point in our lives in one way or the other. And if you're struggling with that debt, there are people that we can help put you in touch with and can help you uh, and get you through this mire. 
the debt situation tends to be delayed by a lot of people because typically people will max out their credit cards. If they're in trouble, they'll max the credit card out. They'll probably go and max out their overdraft. They then might turn to the bank of mum and dad or, or a friend and say, look, you know, I'm having some financial difficulties. Can you help? And so on. And then and only then will perhaps one in three people who really need the help come and, and try and access those professional services. And one thing I will always say to you is debt advice in this country is available free of charge. If you need help, if you've got mates, if you've got people down at the gym or the pub that you know, and you know they're struggling, <clears throat> never ever pay for debt advice. You can get it free. Come and talk to us at the Money and Pension Service. What I don't want you to do is suffer in silence. We all have financial concerns and difficulties at some point in our lives. Um, I just want you to know that there is help and support available for you. Spread the word, not just for everybody on this call this morning, but your, your friends, your colleagues. You know, we all know people, whether it's in, you know, I live in a small village. I know there's some people who are struggling. It doesn't matter who those people are. We're here to help everybody. Uh, and we can help everybody. So um, all this information I'll, I'll share with you via Greg uh, after this after this program. And before I sort of move, because I'm conscious of a 10 to 11 uh, comfort break, et cetera, that, that Greg mentioned, a uh, couple of quick things. One is um, we've got a flagship program that I'm absolutely going to recommend and push to you. It's completely free to use, and it's called couch to financial fitness and i make no uh, qualms at all that we completely robbed the title from couch to 5k um and <laughs> whether that's a copyright infringement i don't know but we haven't been told off about it yet um but couch to financial fitness is a 10-week program you can sign up free uh, through the money helper website and it it goes over all these different sorts of financial well-being and money guidance topics some of which i've just briefly touched on this morning and you can take this learning in bite-sized chunks and we are having our hands bitten off to get access to this program so it won't cost you a penny sign up and i promise you that at the end of two and a half months at the end of that nine or ten weeks um, for a lot of people particularly if you're not very confident with your finances or, you know, you, you might be pretty knowledgeable in one or two areas, but do you know what? I actually don't know enough about credit and I want to borrow money. Go and have a look at Couch to Financial Fitness. Um, it's a really, really good program. We developed it during, well, we started work on it during the first lockdown and it was something that we needed to put together <clears throat> that people could access for themselves at home in their own spare time lunchtime at work whatever it is but all these details are sent over but it really is a fab a fab program and the last very quick thing before we we fire over to a couple of questions potentially is talking about money and this is the last thing i'm going to touch on here we we aren't very good about talking about money in this country uh i don't know whether it's sort of the british slip off a step off a lip thing but it's one of those things that um you know many many years ago it just wasn't done you didn't sit around the dining table of an evening and, and talk about money it simply it simply wasn't cricket but do you know what talking about money and having those conversations and being open about it is really really important sometimes you might have to have difficult conversations about money with your family or, or with your friends you know perhaps you know with your partner or your spouse it might be difficult to talk about your money goals perhaps you can't afford to go out at the weekend and you, you don't really want to talk to your friends about that there are lots and lots of different reasons why being healthy and open about talking about money is actually okay and it's really positive for you for your family it's a really positive thing for communities and you know i would absolutely encourage you we've got a lot of content and information about i know it sounds silly but actually how to talk about money how to take that sort of taboo element away from it i was quite lucky my parents talked about money when we were at home now we we didn't grow up um with a lot of money at all but they were still quite open and so i understood a bit about banks and i understood a bit about what interest was and 
how to sort of start to think about money objectives. And this is really important as well. All you parents and carers out there start having these conversations with your with your youngsters, you know, and the earlier, the better. Even if it's things like going around the supermarkets, you've got the kids hanging on the trolley, you know, and you're having a conversation about two for one offers. What does that mean? Or a discount on cheese. What does that mean? It doesn't matter. It starts to get youngsters thinking about what money is and, and why it has a value. So that's really important. I'll send you some of that stuff through as well. I'm going to stop talking and Greg, I'm going to hand back to the floor, I suppose, to see if anybody wants to ask anything or if anybody has any comments, because we've got about four or so minutes until break time. Thank you, Paul. Um, I've got a hand up from Natasha. So, yeah. Hello, Natasha. Natasha. Good morning. Hello. Um, thank you for all of that. That was incredibly informative. Um, I also work for the wellbeing team and run a community program called the One You program. So it's basically helping peace, people with like nutrition, health. And one of the things that we talk about is stress and finances tends to come up uh, a lot with that. And I guess there's because it's in deprived communities, we've had quite a few conversations around you know, financial struggles and, you know, budgeting to the point of, I was speaking to a lady in her, I think late forties, early fifties, and the subject of pensions came up and she said, I haven't even got a pension. That's a rich person thing. I need the money now. And I guess I kind of felt really out of my depth as to, to where to support. I mean, we've got like the money advice Plymouth, um, but it kind of felt like there was more tailored help. And I'm just wondering if this couch to financial fitness would have, do you think that would be something appropriate to recommend to people? Um, yeah, cert certain people, yes. I mean, I think that not everybody has a lot of um, confidence when it comes to yeah. talking about my Natasha. So it won't, <clears throat> excuse me, it won't be suitable for everybody. Um, if mm. people struggle with the basics around finances, um, it might not be ready for them yet. But what I will do, Natasha, there's two things that I'm going to um, mention here. One is that when I provide some information to Greg and colleagues um, after this event, um, I'll, I'll expand on that, Natasha, and, and put down some more information as to the sort of help that is available and, and what might be suitable. But also as well, I'm going to put the details out of a program that we run at the Money and Pension Service called Money Guiders. <clears throat> now, Money Guiders is a project that we developed um, and we trialled last year, and it's, it's gone through successfully as a trial. So lots of people out there, such as yourselves, in the course of your working day, you might be having conversations with people that you're engaging with, and those conversations might be around money. And yet that's not actually part of your your day to day remit. So our program called Money Guiders is designed specifically to help organisations across um, the UK. But there's quite a lot taken it up in the southwest and it's to upskill those members of staff or those volunteers who are in these organisations having those conversations. I'll put some information on about that as well. Greg, it might be something that, that Live Well wants to have a look at um, and participate in. It, it's, um, it's not at cost, um, but it, it's a great upskill program. So, Natasha, I'll develop on that when I get back to Greg for you. Um, awesome. Sue. Hello, Sue. <clears throat> Hello. Hello, Paul. Um, my question is mm. about the state pension. Yes. OK, yesterday I had lunch with a friend and an ex-colleague who has worked since she was 18 and she took redundancy, voluntary redundancy at 64. So she'd worked for 46 years and paid yeah. in 46 years worth of national insurance contributions. Um, she's going to claim, she said to me yesterday, I'm going to claim my state pension this year. And when I contacted them, they said they still owe two years. I wouldn't get my full pension. And she said, I do not understand how I can work for 46 years when they say you've got to work 30 something. Paid in national insurance contributions all that time. Yeah. But, okay. Um, yeah. on, that, on that one, Sue, what I what I will provide to you, the, the, again, there's the two things I can think of off the top of my head here. 
and I, I'm certainly not a state pension expert. However, there is um, a government portal that you can access pretty straightforward and you can you can have a look at your.